friends. Man, it's good to see you. Let's get Bible class started. <clears throat> the problem is that fellowship is so enjoyable that uh, I kind of get held up a little bit. So thank you for your patience. <clears throat> Come on. All right. Let's turn to John chapter 6. And we're going to do a deeper dive. So I can't wait. I want us to think together about the theme of the gospel of John. Because the idea in doing the deeper dive is connecting the dots. That's the whole idea. Um, when you think about that little thing that they taught us in elementary school, you know, uh, the neck bones connected to the, right? So the idea is that if one thing is affected, the rest of it in some way or another is affected. So what do we know from the lesson so far? And this is important. In John chapter 6, it's the first time that one of the seven signs is linked with one of the seven I am statements. Now, in here, I want to take a moment and investigate this. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. To us, that's just a semantic construction. To the Jews, it's something along the line of hearing this phrase, liberty and justice for all. That's connected to something. We don't just say that. Now, we might believe it. Someone might say, well, what do you hope for? Well, you know, I'm thinking liberty and justice for all. Oh, that's a good thing, but we know that that's connected to something that is a part of our DNA as citizens of this country, right? If somebody says, you know, we the people, you're like, oh, no, I've heard that somewhere. So when they heard I am, they heard something that we don't necessarily hear. I'm going to give you a scripture reference. Exodus 3.14 now, that's important because uh, when Moses is asked or asked God, who will I tell them has sent me? His answer is, tell them I am, depending, depending on the translation, that I am, what I am, who I am. I am that I am has sent you. So that came to be known as the name of God. I am. But there's a scholar at the University of Wales who challenges the concept in the Gospel of John that all of the statements are linked to Exodus 14 or Exodus 3:14. And the reason is because in the prophetic books it is a slightly different construction. Slightly different. The difference is I am he now, what's interesting is there are seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. There are at least 16 I am he statements. Now, I'm going to illustrate this. Go back to chapter 4 when Jesus is sitting with the woman at the well. Chapter 4. <clears throat> Everybody ready? <clears throat> Verse 25. Verse 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. That's one of them. Now, there's at least 16 of these. So when you think about the gospel of John, there are a minimum of 23 I am statements. There are either seven big I am, I am the bread of life, I am the resurrection of life, I am the truth, the way, the way, the truth, the life, or it's like this, I am he. What does that mean? I am the one that fulfills prophecy. I am the one that was coming. Now this becomes incredibly important in chapter six because notice with me, if you would, we had to skip over this in the sermon. So if you come to chapter six, Notice what it says in verse 14. After the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they begin to say, Surely this is the prophet 
who is to come in to the world. This is the prophet. Look back at chapter 1. When they investigate John the Baptist, let's look at chapter 1 and let's begin in verse 19. They are investigating, they're investigating John the Baptist. Look at what it says. Verse 19. Now this is John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He didn't fail to confess, but confessed freely. I'm not the Messiah. Well, then they ask him, who are you? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? Everybody see that? Flip over to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. When you get there, the frame of reference is important. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is, has just completed three things. He sent the disciples on a limited commission to go preach the gospel and to tell people the kingdom is near. He then feeds the 5,000, chapter 14. Then he feeds the 4,000. Everyone comes together in Matthew chapter 16. And notice, if, if you would, that in chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, so who do the people say the Son of Man is? What's their answer? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. This concept of Jesus being a prophet like unto Moses comes out of the book of Deuteronomy where Moses himself declares that a prophet like unto himself will arise. So if you understand that they say, when they saw the signs, could this be the prophet? The prophet is a fulfillment of the prophet like unto Moses. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is explaining what's happened in the healing of the lame man and the impact that that should have on them. In Acts chapter 3, let's begin in verse 17. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God has fulfilled what he has foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Verse 22. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from his people. Can I get someone to read Deuteronomy 18.15? Deuteronomy 18.15. Can I get someone to read that, please? Raise your hand if you get there and you're willing to read. Okay, April. What does Moses say? God is going to raise up a prophet. 
What does Peter say, quoting that verse in Acts 3.22? God has done it. Who is it? Well, it's not John the Baptist. How do you know that? Because John chapter 1, John said, I'm not the prophet. Who is the prophet? It's Jesus. Now, why is that such a big deal in a chapter about bread? Why is it such a big deal to connect Jesus with the prophecy about being the prophet that would be raised up like unto Moses? Why is that such a big deal in a chapter about bread? That's right. That's right. So what happens? The people of Israel come to the Red Sea. What does God do? Parts the Red Sea so that the people do what? Walk across on dry ground. What is Jesus about to do? He's about to walk on water. It's all connected. Who's the one that launched this episode? Jesus. Let me back up. First sign, water to wine. How did that one get rolling? Yeah, ran out of wine, and his mom said, fix this. Is that not what happened? Miracle number two, in John, I mean, in John, the nobleman, the healing of the nobleman. How did that one get going? The boy is sick unto death. What does his dad do? Goes to Jesus and says, I need your help. That's how that one got going. The third one, the healing of the lame man. We've already studied this. How did that one get going? Jesus did it. Do you notice a shift? Because how does this one get going? Jesus does it. Everybody see that? So now Jesus is initiating so this is very important. Jesus sets up a sign so that he can set up the teaching and the application. He does the sign. It awakens people. And then Jesus goes to work cultivating the meaning of the sign. The people think they got it. Look at verse 15. They've connected the dots. Manna from heaven. Prophet unto Moses. Verse 15. Someone read that for us. Lynn, would you read that for us, verse 15? Uh, John 6. Yeah, John 6, 15. Just look at what they do. Yep. Yep, okay. So think about this. You got 5,000 men. Yeah, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it gives you all these clues. They're in a remote area. You know, it's up in Galilee, away from Jerusalem, where a lot of revolutionaries started, right? They're up there, 5,000. They're following him. Why? John 6, 1 and 2. Why are they following him? Because they saw the signs. So see, the, you know, the excitement's already rolling, right? They're getting excited. So they get there, and they think, this is it. So they're actually going to make him king, grab him, take him, raid him. This word in Greek always has the idea of violence. It's like Jesus is going to get swept away by them. He sees it, so what does Jesus do? He leaves. All right? Try to put yourself in the dust storm. You know, this is back in the day, right? They're on the hillside. Put yourself in the dust storm. You know, there's particles in the air. People are sneezing and hacking, right? Put the smells out there. They've just ate loaves and fish. Get yourself in the scene. This is it. If you look carefully at, at Mark and Luke, 
he has them sit in 50s and 100s. Could that have felt like a military camp? We're ready to go. Here it is. Yes. That's it. That's it. We've got to seize on this. I'm going to restate what Lehman said. The people believe they know something about Jesus that he doesn't. He's the king, but he doesn't know it. We've just got to make him know who he really is. Ready to go. But Jesus does know who he is. How many of you have heard the argument? This is later in the lesson, but because you brought up this great point, I'm going to say it now. How many of you have heard the argument that this is why Judas betrayed Jesus? Have you ever heard this argument from scholars? That he was trying to force Jesus' hand. That he never meant for him to get killed. He was trying to force his hand. Have you not heard that argument from scholars? Some of you have. That's what he, that, people think that's what Judas was aiming for. And that that's why he threw the money back and killed himself is because it all went south. You know, we'll never know, right? But do you understand why some people would think that? That Judas is thinking the same thing. He just doesn't get it. Hmm. So now I've got a question for you. What might you have wondered if you were there that day? Do your best to put yourself in that group. What might you have wondered if you were there? And suddenly, this kind of this rush to make him king kind of falters. And suddenly he's gone. And then you're looking around for the disciples and you can't find them. And somebody says, oh, they got in a boat. They left. What? Yeah, but where are they from? Oh, they're from Capernaum, Bethsaida. Oh, that's the other side of the lake. Well, let's get there. The Bible says they ran on foot. Put yourself in the crowd. What are you wondering? What are you thinking? Lehman's already brought up one thing we're probably thinking. What else? Yeah. I'm going to repeat what Connie said. If he'd just get it, our lives would be better. Things would be more just. The world would be more like it ought to be. What else? Mm. Now, Wendy brings up the counterpoint, right? Maybe we thought wrong. Maybe we thought. But now there's kind of some cracks in his story, some weaknesses. Maybe he's not the guy. Isn't that something? What does Jesus point out himself? Look back at John 6. What does Jesus actually say to them when they catch up to him? Look at verse 26. <clears throat> what does Jesus say when they catch up to him? Verse 26. What does he say? Yeah, that's it. He says, let's put a stake in the ground and let's at least identify where we all are. You chased me down around the top end of this lake. And the truth is that you want more bread. Now, if I'm in the crowd, that might sting a little bit, but it might also be true. <laughs> I saw this illustrated by one of my favorite preachers, Jeff Walling. I'm, I grew up in Oregon. Jeff grew up in California. I met him when I was 16 and he was 19. He was preaching already. His daddy was a preacher. But Jeff did this illustration about this text. He reached into his pocket and he brought out a stack of dollar bills. And this was at a youth rally. So he had a kid on the front row and he hands this kid a dollar bill, right? So the kid took it, right? And Jeff said, you want another one? <laughs> Kid's like, yeah, but he gave him another one. He said, you want another one? Well, yeah. 
well, this is a smart kid. So it's what he starts noticing is there's a stack, right? And as long as he's going to keep giving him dollar bills, he ain't going to ask any other question, right? There is no other question. Let's not mess this up. It's not like how many were you planning to give me, Mr. Walling, right? It's just keep handing the dollar bills. So what they're teetering on here is right there. If Jesus hands them more bread in this exact moment, they're going to be like that teenager on the front row, and, they're, and it's going to reinforce. We just keep getting bread. But Jesus says the problem is that's not what this is about. So here's three things I want to make sure we don't miss in this study. Here's number one. Jesus wants you to have physical bread. Now, that may not sound like what I was saying, but it's true. The Apostle Paul says that if we have something to eat and we have covering, we'll be content with that. All through Scripture, God promises to provide for it, and Jesus taught us to pray. Give us this day our, you say it, our daily bread. So I want to stop for a moment, and I want, to, I want to pull us back from binary thinking. Binary thinking says what? It's either physical bread or spiritual bread. That's not in this text. Where does Jesus start? physical bread. Do you remember the quote I shared earlier from Mahatma Gandhi? That some people are so hungry that the only way that God can show up to them is if he appears as bread. Okay, we get that, right? Everybody on board with that? So the idea that in mission work, the only thing we should care about is sharing the gospel isn't even consistent with what Jesus does in one miracle here. It's not consistent with what God did in the wilderness for 40 years. If you haven't read it lately, go back and read Deuteronomy 8. God says that in the land, I will provide for you. So I want to make sure that we understand that God intends to provide for our physical needs. I just want to lay that out. There's nothing wrong with praying about it. There's nothing wrong with praying about your finances. There's nothing wrong with praying for the provision of the Lord. I see some of you in this uh, room who have children in college. Ain't nothing wrong with you praying about being able to handle all that as it's come along. Because I know what you're up against. Susan and I made payments to several special institutions for a very long time. All right. So I know what you're facing. Some of you have have, have wondered. Listen to how we say it. Just listen to how we say it. Lord, you know, I want to pray about my job, but I know sister so-and-so has it so much worse. As if what? As if God has somehow got to choose because God's kind of limited in his resources. He's on a budget. So that if you're praying, then sister so-and-so might get cut out, you know, because God, what are we talking about? (laughs) Right? Another illustration that helped me with the provision of God. This was very helpful to me. We actually did this many, many years ago in the church here. But the illustration that was given me was this. Have all 7 billion people of the world, give them all a one-gallon bucket. All of them. All 7 billion. So that's 7 billion gallon buckets. Send them all to the coastline. All on the same day at the same time. And all at once, on the count of three, we're going to dip our bucket into the ocean, all seven billion of us, all at the same time. What's it going to do to the ocean? Nothing. Nothing. You're not going to notice it at all. God says, I hold oceans in the palm of my hand. Ask for what you need. That's number one. I'm going to try to get through this. But uh, back in uh, 92, 1992, we were living in Indiana. And I'd, I was, uh, I'd been in the hospital for 40-some days or whatever it was. No, I was in the hot. I don't remember what it was. I was, it doesn't matter. I was in intensive care for a long time. I finally came home, and I was on this medicine trying to save my life from a blood infection of all things. 
and it was a wipeout. This doesn't sound like a lot now, but this was 92. My medicine was almost $400 a day. And that doesn't sound like a lot now. I understand that because some of you know of more expensive medicine. But then $400 a day was out of control, right? And we were scared to death. And here I am. I've got four kids at the time. I'm laying in bed. I'm feeling it. And I'm laying there and I can feel the tears going down the side of my head and into my ears. I'm so worried. I'm so worried. Can you relate to that a little bit? So worried. So I didn't know what to do. So I prayed. I just thought, God, we're going to make it. And something kind of came over me. So don't look at it like that. You got me. The next day I got up, and we had a car at the time, a black Mustang. Got up, and I put that in the auto trader. Now, the way that used to work back then is that meant it went out in an auto trader magazine that was published once a month. That meant that your advertisement was in the magazine for 30 days, it, even if you sold it on day one. It was in there for 30 days. The magazine came out two days later. I got a call on day one. A family came to our house, didn't even try to bring the price down. They paid us cash for that car, the exact asking price. And we never got another call for 30 days. Never got another call. It just convinced me that God cares about bread. That's all I'm trying to say. That is all I'm trying to say. You know, it it bothers me when people talk in those terms, like all God cares about is the spiritual part, because that's not true. It's just not true. We, We have to discipline ourselves to do better with that. So that's number one. God is good with giving you bread. And I love that. That's number one. Okay. But you'll notice the second thing that happens is that God wants to generate an appetite. He wants to expand your appetite. Right? So that I'm hungry for more than just (laughs) physical bread. Right? So... If I could say it this way, what God wanted me to do in that prayer moment was remember to rely on him. Now, how many of you can walk away from a prayer moment like that and there's no residual effect? Maybe you're not like me, but every now and then that happens, right? And the next time I have a problem, I'm just as anxious and worried as I was the last time. Anybody else struggle with that? So part of the impact is developing an appetite for more than just the fulfillment of the current concern, right? So that's the second thing that happens. But the third thing that happens is Jesus says, I need you to keep following the breadcrumbs until you get to me. Because I'm actually what brings you life. It's me, okay? Okay. Now, I'm going to illustrate this. There's a song in our songbooks called, All to Jesus I Surrender, right? All to Him I Freely Give. We're familiar with that, right? So we change a pronoun and we say, All to Jesus I Surrender, All to You I Freely Give. There's a song in our songbooks, um, uh, There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue. He framed the worlds with his great might. He is our God. He is alive. You familiar with that? So you change a pronoun. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. You tinted skies with heavenly hue. You framed the worlds with your great might. You are my God. You are alive. And in you I live and I survive. One of them 
is talking about God, which is a good witness. But the other one is talking with God. And that exercises the development of that appetite to where I actually am not satisfied until I get to him. And I'm taking him into my life. So, we think of some famous stories. Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus is transformed by his experience with Jesus. Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house, meets a woman. It's a sinful woman. Her life is transformed by her experience with Jesus. How is your life being transformed by your experience with Jesus? What is Jesus doing with you right now? How are you taking him in? How are you experiencing him right now? How are you eating his flesh and drinking his blood? How are you doing that right now? Let's just talk through a few ways that you're doing that. How's that happening for you? Yeah, I want to I want to relate what Yolanda said. So she said, you know, I'm a person that struggled with depression. Right. And so she gets up in the morning and she sets the tone for the day by having a conversation with Jesus so that she can start the day relying on Jesus. How many of you have ever started to slip? and reached out to grab something as you were slipping because you didn't want to fall. Do you know I tore my rotator cuff in the stairs back up here in, in this church building because I was walking down the stairs and I had condensation on a cup and it dripped onto the, Lee, you'll remember this, dripped onto the steps. I slipped, right? And reaching out to grab that rail as I'm falling, <laughs> You know, I go up and down that thing a hundred times after that, and it's, it's kind of funny. I'm more attached to that rail than I used to be. That is a true story. That is a true story. I'm way more attached to that rail. It's changed how I do a lot of things because, man, that was hard to get over. That, that rotator cuff, that was hard to get over. So, see, now I start with the rail. Are you, you get where I'm going with that? Now you're, that's what you're saying to us. You're starting with your hand on the rail in the morning. Right. Oh, that's good. Isn't that good? Okay, someone else. Someone else. How's it, how's it happening for you? Are you all loving this? This is scream therapy, right? Did you hear what Connie said? You know, she's like, she starts off complaining. It's all kind of going downhill. And then she just starts screaming thanks at the top of her lungs. Now, what would be hilarious is the other drivers around her, right? Like, what is going on in there, right? It don't matter what's going on in there. You're having a little talk with Jesus, and that's what's going on in there, right? So what's, what's wild about this is when, if, if, we don't develop the appetite for Jesus, then we will run out of religious steam. That's what ends up happening. Right? You develop the appetite for Jesus, and then it's never ending. Because what does he say? You eat this bread, you'll never hunger again. You drink this water, you will never thirst again. 
to you. I'll have all you need, right? So I get to go out and visit my mother. She turns 85 here in uh, about two weeks. So I'm out on the farm. Oh, my goodness, what a blessing. But the biggest blessing is spending all this time with my mom. And, you know, it's, there's nowhere to go. You're 54 miles from town. I mean, it's a tight circle, right? So I'm with my mom, and something hits me. She is growing spiritually like crazy. She's almost 85. She has got her foot to the floor on her spiritual growth. And I'm watching it. And I'm watching things that would have been very difficult for my mom at one time, nearly impossible to navigate. And now I'm watching her navigate these things very smoothly. And I know it's because of her walk with the Lord and the time in his word, right? I I know that's what's happening. So she's starting her day in the morning, and she's uh, 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 listening to music that helps her tune into Jesus. She very, she's very, very methodical about her newscasts, and she spreads them through the day, and they're limited. They start and they stop. And in between, there's time with the Lord. So that way, it's the voice of the Lord that's guiding her response to the newscast rather than the newscast guiding her response to the Lord. The Lord has the upper hand. That's nice, isn't it? Isn't it something? Yeah. It's overwhelming to me. I've got a picture. Yes. So Lehman is referring to the the pictures that I put online. I will say this and then we'll close. I have a picture of me laying across my grandmother's chest on that farm 60 years ago. Right. It's always been a part of our lives. But all those pictures started out black and white. Because some of us have a few uh, uh, laps on us, right? They all start out black and white. And then they turn to color, right? And those are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But to listen to my mom talk about the Lord through those scenes is the most beautiful thing of all. She'll say, didn't the Lord do a beautiful job as the sun brings out the yellows in that tree? Didn't the Lord do a beautiful job? And she, everything just connected that way, right? That's what's transformative. So Jesus just says, listen, I'm all about giving you bread, number one. But I want to develop your appetite, number two, so you don't miss out on me, number three. Amen? All right, God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you so much. Oh, hey, if you're new to the class and you haven't signed this, sign it, because each week we send out a video of a lecture series on John. And if you want to be a part of that, be sure and sign this.